All right, let's get started. Apologies for the delay. Let's see. So homework three is due tonight. We'll release the uh, answers as soon as the late deadline has passed. Uh, so this week, I'm actually going to be out of town on Thursday, so I'm going to move um, office hours to Wednesday from 4 to 4 to 5. I don't think there's a lab at that time. If there is, let me know. I can have other lab section or other office hours as well. I had an extra one last week when somebody asked, so just let me know. <clears throat> uh, exam logistics for Friday. So uh, practice exams are on the class website. Um, we'll review, do a uh, midterm review on Wednesday. And Tuesday night, the data sheets will be released. So this, lab, this class, we do exams a little bit differently. Um, instead of giving you huge problems that are like yeah, design problems where you have to read lots and lots of information and synthesize it as fast as you possibly can, and that's the method of like grading your successes, how fast can you synthesize information, we give you the data sheet beforehand. So you can read through it at your leisure, you can discuss it, you can ask questions about it. That way, the, the, the game, or not the game, but the task is to apply the knowledge you already have, not learn it as fast as possible. So online, you also see the data sheets. Do you have any questions about that aspect of exam logistics? Yeah. Uh, you don't get note sheets. We'll give you um, everything you need. Uh, there'll be 
you know, typical instructions that you would need, a hex table, you, uh, the exams are typical of what you'll get. So you can bring a calculator, we'll give you blank paper. Any other logistics questions? Yeah? Do we need a calculator? Or would you just recommend it? I don't know. No, you don't really need a calculator, but you're welcome to have one. Scientific calculator. I believe so. If you go look at them, I mean, maybe I modify them a little bit. I made separate data sheets. But there's an example uh, on the web now of like what I gave out as a reference sheet. So that's what uh, you'd get that. So you get those instructions. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is this data sheet data sheet different than what we've seen before? Like is like it's different from the STM. Uh, it is different from the SEM because if I printed out the SEM data sheet, that would be huge. And so what I said is I'd, I'd focus your in, you know, on exactly what you need to know, but I mirrored the style of the, of the data sheet. So usually there's, I introduce some new part, maybe, you know, I don't know, temperature sensor or something. And then, you know, there's like how the thing works, like theory of operation. And then there's probably some, you know, time interface specs that you'd have to understand. Lab this week, correct? Uh, you, you're starting your lab. You basically get two weeks to do your lab. So la no labs are due. If I remember correctly. Here, let's let's go look. Let's find out. Uh, okay, yeah. So you're finishing up. Sorry, you're finishing up. Uh, I was off by one. But okay, you're finishing up lab three this week, and then you'll start. Uh, yeah, you're starting lab four. Go for it. Let's start it. This, is, this looks like because lab three is due next week. You're, this is what you're doing. So you are, you started lab three next week. This is not when it's due. This is when you're doing it. Oh, okay. My apologies. The, whatever Grayscope says is the official thing. This is my proxy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this will be in the data sheet. So I'm going to give you the data sheet during the exam as well. Okay. And then the, the same data sheet, you'll give it the exact same one. So they still need to tell like not. Yes. Uh, so sometimes people look through it and be like, hey, your addresses are insane. Or maybe your logic said to go up when it probably should be low. OK. So then I'll go make a note on Piazza and say, hey, we're going to make, we're going to fix the data sheet. And I'll, it's a, Google Docs will be live updated so everybody will know and we'll lock it down like 24 hours beforehand so there's no like last minute cramming. Uh, what other questions you have? Okay. Um, so we couldn't get, well, I don't know why they gave these rooms, but these are the rooms they gave you. Uh, so it'll be this room, this is what, 10, 6, 17, right? I don't know. I just I just walk here. I don't know what the room numbers are, uh, and then we'll have the room. I think down the hallway that way a little bit. Um, okay. And for those who need an alternative time or uh, location, uh, I'll contact you later today. We already have those spaces reserved. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. So we'll talk about a component of the day. Has it who you? Who here has used a servo for something? Man, Jack, you guys are. Some, some of you have already have uh, much knowledge, that's fine. Many of you don't. So, a servo is just a special type of motor. Uh, it has a DC motor in here that spins, uh, it has a potentiometer, so it knows the orientation. And then it has a circuit here that's trying to keep the, sur the, the arm or the angle at a particular location. And then it has a nice three-wire interface where it's just ground, power, and then one signal, usually, what is it? Usually the orange, yeah. And instead of trying to write data into it like you would a, like a serial bus, like actual characters, you're going to control where the arm is with time. So you're going to send pulse width modulation. So you send pulses out, and the width of those pulses tell the servo what angle to be at. So it's a very nice way to make robots. It's one wire to to control it, and even if you try to deflect it a little bit, it will try to go back. So it has its own little control loop in there. 
there's two different types. There's ones that will go like uh, 90 to plus or minus 90, or maybe plus or minus 180. And there's one that will continuously rotate. The difference is this one, you tell it what position you want. Here, the pulse width say which direction, what speed you want. And then just so everybody knows, you can do things like this. So here, the person has an IMU in their little controller, and this thing rotates around uh, and mimicking his controls, right? So those are sorts of things you can build with servos. Any questions? Okay, so today we're gonna talk about interrupts. <clears throat> um, we're gonna talk about polling versus interrupt, interrupt vector tables, and a little bit of the uh, nested vector interrupt controller. So, um, oftentimes we wanna deal with asynchronous events. So these are events that aren't necessarily part of the program that you've executed. Um, there are a couple of these events are so sometimes your application, uh, application, sometimes software does something illegal or it divides by zero, that could be one. The most common one is like some external peripheral needs attention. It wants to get your, um, it wants the core to do something. So now how do we know? So let's see. So the, the most normal, or the way you've been doing it in lab so far is what we call polling. So you're gonna go look for a pen, you're gonna write code that says load from a, or uh, yeah, load from a pin and see if there's any action on it. Um, and the more uh, sophisticated, more responsive way to do it is interrupts where the pin itself, essentially a GPO port, could say, hey, something has happened over here. I want you now to take a look at it. That allows the processor to go and do other tasks. So the aversion of polling is essentially trying to text without with notifications off. You basically have to look at your phone at all times to see if notification of a text message came in, that's not very efficient. And <clears throat> from a coding point of view, you can kind of see why. So here's some, here's an example code. Uh, these addresses clearly don't make any sense, but say you have some addresses uh, in your registers, uh, and then you could go and say your goal is to, when somebody presses a button, you want an LED to go off, you can go and read from a particular location and then store that bit in, uh, an, in the pin that's responsible for the LED and just keep going back and forth. And this is effective, you know, it's all software based, it's fast and responsive, however, you don't really have time for anything else. This is all you're ever gonna do in this example, and hey, if this is the best way to solve the problem, go for it, right? And only the development time was slow, power is gonna be high, but okay. Uh, so you waste, in a sense, 100% uh, of the cycles because you're only doing one thing from the perspective of trying to do anything else, and it eats a lot of power. And then you can see as the, but it was effective. And then you see you're trying to put work into this thing. So say you do 100 cycles of something else. Well, here you do some work, but it slows down the amount of time it takes to do polling, right? So here, you, now you've introduced latency, 100 cycles of latency between when you press the button and when the LED goes on. And maybe that toy example, that's acceptable, but generally um, uh, it wouldn't be if it's very large. And here the, you increase, you get 90% utilization of your processor um, because you're actually doing some other task, but you have suffered latency. And so the so as, as we start increasing the amount of work that gets done, so now we have more jobs, you know, tens of thousands or thousands of cycles, and more and more buttons to, to go after, it becomes unmanageable to be able to be reactive and get work done. So as basically as your code gets more complicated, Reacting to external things using polling becomes less responsive. Any questions with this toy example? Should teach should you should believe now that polling is horrible. Hey, this is just bad. Okay, so we can do better. So uh, this is where interrupts come from. So interrupts is this uh, idea of breaking uh, from uniformity. But so some event occurs and you're going to break the execution flow. There's different types of uh, interrupts. Uh, let's see. So this typically means that you're going to have an event that happens and your CPU is going to do some other tasks. So we're going to call that an interrupt service routine. Uh, typically, an uh, interrupt service routine does a small amount of work. You're not trying to write a whole large program in there because then you're kind of stuck doing the interrupt service routine. It's hard to interrupt interrupts. And so typically you have a main function and then interrupt does something that will be get the main program ready to have a response. Um, 
Uh, interrupt is just a glorified procedural call. The trick is that no, typically code does not call it. Some other event at, causes this procedure to go forward. So there's two ty different types. Um, you have table misses and illegal operations, and sometimes your bus fails. All these would be called system exceptions or maybe system interrupts or internal interrupts. These are not necessarily things you have to worry about, but these are handled by your microcontroller and things to be aware of. Um, what's typically focused on this class is external interrupts. And so these are things like a power failure, external buttons pressed, maybe you have uh, SPI or SPI or I squared C communication with another chip and that thing wants to talk or something or data is ready to be read. Uh, system timers, which we'll talk about, and maybe your ADC is ready. <coughs> In this class, we'll call those interrupts. Sometimes you'll see those with the term external interrupts, but just to be clear, they're only external from the core. That's the concept here. It's not external from the chip. It could be, but like a system timer or an ADC is of something that happens on your chip, and it will alert the core when it's ready. So that's where the term external comes up. All right, let's go fast and kind of, we'll go over the high level and we'll dig into the details. But so interrupt hardware, um, generally is hardware, but generates an interrupt signal. Uh, you have to, or the system has to determine which interrupt has been fired because there's going to be multiple possible interrupts on the system. Then it executes some code. Uh, the main stops functioning. We go do this extra subroutine call. Then we come back and then the processor has to return to the original state, and this is part of the trick. You don't want to change or fundamentally change the program execution if you have something external happening. Um, so a question for you is where, how do we get external interrupts or interrupts from the peripheral to the core? Why don't you take 30 seconds to talk to yourself or talk amongst yourselves, come up with some ideas, and how would you get many? Because there's many, many interrupts. Uh, that have to go from the peripherals uh, back to the core. So how does that happen? What was the pipeline? We will talk, we'll talk about that after the exam, but yes, that does happen. Unless there's something What's that? <coughs> Bullying just means checking. You're just going to go over and ask, Are, is the data ready? Is the data ready? Is the data ready? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. My apologies. Yeah. All right, what do we think? How do we get interrupt signals to the core? Somebody. All right, fine, fair, okay. You need to get the interrupt signals to the NVIC. We haven't talked about that yet. That's what we'll introduce later. But how do we get, how does the NVIC, which is a thing that's going to process it, know that the camera is done taking a picture, the camera peripheral is done? I guess it would be over the uh, bus. OK. The only, what, now what would be one problem with using the bus? I mean, I am arguing, I am asking you a question that you don't have the answer for, I know, so we're just speculating, but what would be the problem with using the bus? Um, I guess it's like, um, <clears throat> there's all these extra signals, like enable and stuff like, and yep. like, um, stuff like that. So, so if it's not listening, it won't, it won't get the interrupt, maybe? Yep, and, sp and also the interrupt controller, so the, AP, uh, see the APB bridge here, uh, it is polling. It has to actually tell the interrupt to talk. The interrupt has no way to say, hey, I have something really important I want to tell you. So if the uh, bridge has not gone through and looked at it, uh, you will miss some event or you'll have higher latency for event. It just turns into polling. 
Any other ideas? Yeah. I kind of like a direct, direct connection to one of these few pins. So like, <coughs> high. So when an interrupt happens, it set the pin to high. So sure. So say we have a case where we want this pin to go. When this pin goes high on some GPIO port, then we want a signal to go to the uh, Invec controller at the core, right? And we, I think what you're meaning is a wire, right? Okay. You may, have, you may have looked ahead, that's fantastic, but there literally are wires there, and there are lots of wires, because each, now we haven't talked about all the variations of interrupt and interrupts that can occur, but what you'll find out is that most GPIO pins can have an interrupt. Most, almost every peripheral has multiple interrupts, and so now you have lots of wires going back that have to be managed. Okay. That looks something like this, is just a, this is from the, uh, I forget what the name of the book is, but one of the reference books I, I, I uh, suggested you look at. This is just showing here, it's a redone diagram, but here's all the peripherals have lots of different wires going into the NVIC. The NVIC gets system ec, uh, inter or exceptions from the core, also gets it from the bus. All those different things um, can cause an interrupt. And so if we look through this, basically, an idea here is we have uh, the, some programs running. Oh, some external interrupt occurs. Then the task is that NVIC, and this is in hardware, and we'll talk about the details in a second, has to go and choose. I saw some interrupt go off. Now I need to go to this table. It's called the interrupt vector table, and it holds a list of all the places in which interrupt service routines are at. And so here it's going to say, for whatever reason, it's unknown at this moment, but here, this interrupt service routine needs to call the memory location uh, 5C, which is external interrupt IRQ, which is basically external interrupt 1, uh, the IRQ. And that states that it should go to some memory location. So now we are at some code in memory. We're going to execute that code. When we're done, we're going to go back to exactly the same point we were at in, main, in our main program. And it should be agnostic to the main program. So this interrupt service routine in like a general computer, is this written like the operating system executes this code? Yeah. I'm just asking because yeah. we did something similar in 42, but to me this seems like it's purely hardware based. That's why I'm just ah, so the so the core runs a service routine. We don't have a second core. So this is arbitrary code execution that you will write that is in the uh, interrupt service routine. Now the trick is how does the hardware know where that code is? Well that the address of this thing is here and then the location so it gets an interrupt that says go to that thing, looks it up and says okay start running that code over there. So is this like already on our hardware that like we don't write the uh, interrupt service routine? You write the, well uh, the fine folks at STM with CubeID already wrote a bunch for you. But uh, you will go and modify this uh, interrupt service routines. Yeah. So when a signal gets sent, um, like the interrupt wire, it, how does it connect to the network? Literally, is a wire. Like they they so routed. The wire will, what will send like zero x five c. No, a wire will send high or low. Okay. So then, how do you get five c from that? Ah, we're going to get to that. Oh, okay. fair, fair question. We're going to get there. But basically, well, basically each wire is is a map to a particular interrupt uh, least location. We'll talk about that in a second. What other questions we got? Okay. So the vector table is in the end. Well, the vector table is the core thing that keeps the mapping of where signals come in, where the code for the interrupt service routine is. In the vector table, um, oh no, it has old slides. Horrible. <laughs> wah, wah. Oh no, I just have duplicate slides. Okay, ignore that other slide. That was a bad slide. All right, uh, typically we think about the vector table is located uh, basically at 0, 0, 0. The first initial thing is the, the, the stack pointer, or the main stack pointer. That's the, the first thing at 0, 0, 0. Then you have the vector table, and that is that mapping uh, between indexes in memory and 
and then it stores where the interrupts are. Now you will see in lab that STM, so this is, so sorry, this, the way of looking at it, uh, oops, come back, as the main stack pointer and the vector table start at 000, that is their traditional way in which ARM intended their hardware to be used. Um, and that's the way we'll generally talk about it in class. But I wanted to give you fair warning that in lab, uh, they um, make an alias, basically. They copy it over to uh, 0, 8,000, where it flash starts. Because if you want to, say, store your code long term, then you should probably run out of there rather than having to, to take this code and put it back into flash and load it and load it. Um, from flash into SRAM, basically. So all I'm, all I'm pointing out here is that for many reasons, uh, say you want to have a bootloader or you have an OS that needs to have special configuration and they do run OSs on these microcontrollers, uh, sometimes there's aliasing. This, I'm just giving you fair warning that it may be different from what you see in lab versus uh, what we'll talk about for the average microcontroller or Cortex-M4. All right, anyways, so vector table start at 000. This is an example of a vector table. Uh, so it's simply a function, function address. So uh, basically, uh, this is just a list of addresses. And here's your interrupt number. So these interrupt numbers go to literally wires that come in. And the very first location is your location of your main stack pointer. That is the first thing in memory. The reason that is is because the hardware does not necessarily know where the stack, how big memory is and where the stack pointer is. So it needs to at least know that somewhere. So this is uh, put in the first location memory. And then these are all addresses for particular interrupts that need to occur. The next address is the uh, system uh, interrupt handler. So basically reset handler. So when you power on reset, what's supposed to be uh, executed first? Well, the program counter is set to uh, hex four right here. And this is the first, um, the location of the first instruction that will be run on your device. Okay. And basically, it'll just jump right there. Now, you can change that. That's just giving you the option of this is the first section of code. That's the memory location. And you just write a different value in there. And then your microcontroller will do something else instead. So you get, this is where you as a programmer, programmer start getting some control over things. Um, Okay, so you'll notice here, did it not build correctly? Oh, there we go. Uh, you'll notice we have system exceptions. So reset up to whatever that is, system, cystic handler. These are all defined, required by ARM to make sure the core runs. Uh, so, you know, you have to be able to do something on reset, right? Power on reset, a bunch of stuff has to happen. If you have a hard fall or memory fall or bus fall, all those things have to be handled. You also have things like the SysTick, which is a system timer that is used for an OS. Uh, you guys can use it in your bare metal programming as well. But all these are required. And then they give it special interrupt numbers just to make life harder. They give you negative numbers. Okay, And they're just trying to conceptually differentiate between what ARM wants and then the interrupts that STM can have. So STM makes interrupts from zero up, up upwards. right? And so they can have things that are specific for there are peripherals, like an external uh, interrupt handler uh, for a GPIO pin or for an ADC. ARM gives up to, uh, gives an architecture up to 256 IRQs, but STM only did 96 plus 16, 16 being the ones that they were required to plus 96. Why would they choose to do less than the maximum? Wait, so is, is like each interrupt mapped to, map to like one of the pins on the CPU? Yeah. So there's like 100 interrupt pins? Uh, there are a number, a hunt, there are 100 wires going from around the chip into the NVIC. Okay. It could, uh, maybe. Be Sorry, you got to say it louder. Uh, well, that's why uh, ARM only gives 16, and then it gives the chip manufacturers those other ones. But you as a user, sorry, as a programmer, can't really change the number of interrupts. 
you only get the interrupts that STM gives you. But why didn't STM do, why did they only do 96? They could have done 256 and had every little pin, anything that wiggles on that microcontroller could have set off an interrupt. Why would they go for less? Take space. space is complex. It's painful to write. You could, and you will. You can get interrupted too much with 96, and part of a uh, lecture in a couple of weeks will be how do you deal with multiple interrupts going off at a time, and how do you set priorities so you only deal with the ones that are most important. All right, so basically, it's a hardware and a complexity argument about just how big is that and complicated is that NVIC need to be to handle all these things. OK. The program status register holds which interrupt is being fired. So you get an interrupt number there. And if we remember that this is really, the program status register is really just, uh, well, there's three registers that make it up, but these are all individually uh, writable too. They have their own addresses. Uh, and uh, let's see, yeah. And the program uh, execution program register holds the interrupts that you, of what you're on. Now, the problem here is because we have that negative 16, right? And they're not going to put negative numbers in the register. So the program status register holds 16 plus the interrupt number because you have to be off by 16 because they're just trying to make your life slightly difficult and protect everybody from screwing up all the interrupts. Um, so if you know a particular interrupt line has gone off, well, you don't necessarily have to do this. What the program would have to do or the NVIC has to do with, in combination of logic is basically says, OK, I know that this is IRQ7 uh, went off. And then you would just do 7 plus 64. So this is 16, because there's 16 here. But we're going to jump by increments of 4. So 16 times 4, 64. And we're always going to increment by 4, because this is 32 bits wide, but byte addressable. And that's going to give us that the location the memory location that holds the address, or sorry, it holds, yeah, the address and memory of where IRQ handler uh, external one is, is at 5C. So you basically go take that value and say, okay, whatever is in there, start, put that in the program counter and start executing code. So this is, we're trying to figure out how to make that map between things. Work, same thing works for uh, one of these exceptions. Uh, one of the system exceptions, it's just that offset by 64 makes sure that number is always positive. OK. So to bring it back together, interrupt signals come from peripherals. Uh, it, each unique interrupt signal is associated with, the, with a unique interrupt number. So each one of these interrupts here represents a wire that's coming to the NVIC. Do you have a question? No. OK. Um, uh, this association allows the uh, NVIC to call the correct subroutine. As a programmer, uh, you get to control uh, the content and location of the ISR. So you're going to write an interrupt service routine. You're going to say, here's what it does. When I get a button high, I'm going to go turn the LED on. And you can say, you can change where that location is in memory. And all you have to do is go back. The, the location of the ISR, all you have to do is put the uh, ad or the uh, yeah, the address in one of these locations, and when it gets called, it will go to that thing. Now, that's all done from you by the compiler. Uh, it's obfuscates a lot of that away, but I'm just saying that this is the agreement here that the NVIC will call the ISR related to the line that's going high. Somebody's got a question. I'm not that good at lecturing. Yeah. Okay, so, but how does it call the core? Does it, does it change the PC? Or yes, we'll talk about that mechanism, what it does to the core. But we're just going to, in a second, that's a great question. Right now, I just want you to feel, to have the understanding that if this one of these wires goes high, that this NVIC thing goes and figures out what program should be written, or so it should be executed. Um, so, so the NVIC will look in the Table. Correct. And then you will find the correct pointer. Correct. Exactly. And the NVIC is basically combinational logic. This isn't something that you program as a, uh, a 373 student. It just says 
you know, given this line goes high, get this address over here. That's all this job really is. And it has, in a couple of weeks, we'll see how you deal with multiple interrupts going off at time. That's the other job of the NVIC. Yeah. So to clarify, there's uh, ARM supports 256 IRQs. Correct. And we have uh, STM has 96 plus 16. Correct. And STM is already implemented for us. Yeah. All of these ones are uh, Yes. Hold on a second. ARM says we need 16 system exception wires for 16 particular interrupts that occur. The manufacturer is able to put other interrupt wires here. It has chosen to put 96. Okay. Um, those 96 wires are associated with interrupt numbers. And then it runs these addresses. So it, it runs the code that's uh, pointed at here. Now, is that code written for you yet? I don't know. Oh, okay. Right? Um, what are you supposed to do when the ADC goes off? It has no idea. But it's capable of running code. And that will be part of your job is to write what happens when interrupt goes off. Uh, I will say right now, the reset handler is definitely written for you. Or else the thing's not going to turn on. Yeah. So that's what I'm just saying. 96. Hypothetically, is, ni is 96 the upper limit of the number of buttons you're allowed to put? No. Um, you could say, how many interrupts can I simultaneously trigger and keep track of? That is 96. However, that could be separated from buttons. And usually what you have is you will say for a peripheral bank, you'll say, if this particular pin goes high, send up an interrupt. But it's not an interrupt for every single pin, necessarily. It depends on how the hardware is implemented. Yeah. You said most pins could be configured as interrupts. Is that on us to choose which pins specifically are and then we program the NVIC to decide this? Yeah, let, let's say it differently. A peripheral has the ability to raise interrupt pins, or interrupt lines that go back to the NVIC. You can configure, given whatever the data sheet says, that I want to enable a particular interrupt to happen, say, on the rising edge of a particular pin. So it's not that, and you, it's very possible that there's not, say you have 16 pins on a port, that they're not going to give you interrupts for every 16 pins. There's some mapping that has to occur. So let's say some OS on a separate screen device and you click you know, reset the system, you could have an interrupt that calls the reset handler. Yes. So say uh, a common one is literally there's a reset pin on your microcontroller. If that thing gets asserted low, then the whole thing resets. I think that's the logic. Any peripheral could call the reset handler. No. It's not any, every, every individual peripheral goes to a different interrupt number. So only certain things can send off the reset handle. You can't get a GPIO to directly pull this thing. You could have a GPIO and then write code that says go and do this, yes. But it's not directly wired to this. So all the wires, wiring is fixed. So external GPIO port is going to go to whatever, whatever number it's assigned to. So you could you just take the reset handler code and put it in whatever address is assigned to that. Yeah, you could do that. That would definitely be fine to do. We weird, but that's fine. Do whatever you guys need. Yeah. Right, so do do all the pins go to like distinct uh, entries in the table, or can yes. multiple pins go to like the same one? Uh, mm, I don't know. Uh, let's just say, I mean, there's some edge conditions, but basically for the purpose of this is those those interrupt pins that are coming from all those peripherals, these are literally wires that go high or low, are mapped to a unique, each unique interrupt signal here is you map to unique interrupt number. We'll talk about some edge conditions next week. All right. How are we doing? Good question. All right, so just a quick review. I mean, we did a lot of these pieces. So some, let's say some GPIO pin, port A, pin three goes high. We've configured it to send an interrupt over a wire to the NVIC controller. So now it says, okay, this IRQ has gone off. It has to figure out that it's mapped to something. 
So this is say this is wire nine, let's say. Then it has to go and figure out, okay, well that's the ninth uh, interrupt number, but we have that 16 because we have the negative numbering system because ARM wants their things to be special. Okay, so then it goes figures out what memory location in the, in the interrupt table holds the address. Then it resets the core to go after that address. It functions, um, goes to the address, and then you run the interrupt service routine, and then you come back out of that. All right. Yeah. So you're saying this means peripheral three grows the interrupt? Yes, and this is a toy example. So let's say I've configured my, my GPIO port that when a particular pin goes high, I want you to throw an interrupt. Um, it doesn't, you don't really have to keep track of yourself, like, oh my gosh, which interrupt, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's important, but you don't have to really think about, okay, it's this signal. It's just whatever signal from that, this, from that port is literally drawn as a wire to the NVIC, that thing's gonna go high. The NVIC says, I saw that line go high, I have to do a task figure out what uh, memory location in the, from the vector table the core needs to run next. All right, so question for you. Uh, so we just learned that interrupts are basically fancy function calls that are handled by hardware. Um, and you do some, some code. So do ISRs have to be uh, ABI compliant? What do you think? Because you're going to reuse the core, right? So, okay, we're going to say we're going to have to be ABI compliant. Is this a function call? So the question for you guys to talk amongst yourselves is, what other information other than, say, the bottom four registers does the um, interrupt, or does the NVIC have to ensure are saved in, court in order to have uh, forward execution in your program when you come back? Link register ABI just says you gotta if if uh, if I call a function or if a function is called that it has to reserve our fourth upwards, right? So from the callers, from the callee's point of view, I just have to re uh, maintain our zero, or sorry, our four through our 12. Right, that's the thing I have. If I mess those things up, I have to put it back. All right, what do you think? Yeah. Other than being quiet, it's got to store a PC. Okay. Why? Where to get back to the interrupt. Okay. And then you also need to store the stack pointer. Okay. So when you return what stack it's at. What else do you need to keep track of? All the flags. Ooh, that's right. That's very good. Um, the caller save registers that like R0 through all R3. Yep, you gotta save those because the main didn't call the function. Hardware called the function, so you're gonna have to save those. What else? There's one more register. Link register. Why? Hey, you could be main could be deep in several function calls and still has to figure its way back, right? So you can't overwrite the link register, or at least you have to save it if you're going to. Okay, so we have this timing diagram here. Um, we have this user program, then something occurs. Some interrupt, interrupts that signal, interrupts that program call, and we're gonna do what's called stacking, which is the process of saving that data. So in the old stack pointer, you're gonna go through and you're gonna load the um, program status registers, 
the PC, the link register, R12, which is the inner procedural blah, blah, blah register that's only really used for OSs, and then R3 through R0. Okay. Then it's going to go, you're going to do the interrupt handler. Whatever the interrupt handler needs, it's going to go do that. Okay. Then you're going to exit the interrupt, and then you're going to unstack, which basically means you're going to go back. So I did say stack pointer before because I forgot, but the stack pointer is going to, when it unstacks, it's going to go back to the previous location. So the stack pointer is going to be known. It's not like you had to save it for some reason. And then you're going to go back to your user, your user program. So from here to here, it's like the uh, core had amnesia. It has no idea what it was doing. It's like it was sleepwalking. It was doing some other task. And when it comes back here, you know, all the registers are in the right spot, all the program flags, all the information that was required to run this program is still right there. It's just the hardware's responsibility to get, a, to get into the interrupt handler and save all those uh, registers. Okay, and this is done, again, by the INVIC is the thing that's doing it. You don't have to do this. Yeah. Oh, what's the program stack pointer for? Oh, yeah. The program stack pointer. Where do you see that? I, the XPSP. Is that what it's just the, uh, it's the program status register. The whole thing, including interrupts. Uh, if we go back, go back here. I forget why we call it X. I'm sure there's a very good reason, mostly to confuse students. Um, but it contains all these little sub-registers, so all the state information about flags, what interrupts we're running, if you're, you know, this thing called the IT block, all those other things need to be saved. Yeah. We don't, the, the stack pointer is implicitly saved in the sense so I, I misspoke. The stack pointer is going to be, when you unstack, it's going to roll back up, right? There's a row of X's at the top. That's what, that's where the stack pointer was pointing to that. That's somebody else's data, okay? Then you're going to push stuff up to the stack. So you increment first and then load, 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 load. You're going to have this new stack pointer here while you're in the interrupt. And then when you get out, it's going to unstack. So it's going to roll back up. The stack pointer is going to I guess increment, before it was decrementing, here it's incrementing, and it'll be back up at the old stack pointer location when you get back to your program. Yeah. On the other slide, it's called PSR. Is that the same thing as PSP? On the other slide, yes. Yeah. I will, let me take a note to clean up. Yeah. Um, so I have to do the first one. What was R12 again? The interprocedural call Stack register or scratch register, and then the same thing was for the PSR. Wouldn't it take up more space than that? Because isn't it three registers? Ah, but those three registers are concatenated together to make one register. So, if you look how the reserved all line up, you can clamp those all together. So it's one thirty-two bit value. But because it's so sensitive, they don't want you to accidentally be writing over uh, things. So if you, for some reason, needed to mainly write these values, uh, you can do it. It's just they don't want you to accidentally, they don't want you also to have to like load everything out or it, put it back in. They say just write it directly. Oh, uh, PSR. Whatever, whatever, yeah. Let's go back to where we were. Okay. What eight registers? What's that? So we got to get R zero, R one, R two, R three. So we don't have to worry about. Uh, so much in the caller say. Before, before the, so does the hardware handle all of the saving without? Yes, the hardware does the stacking. So the hardware stacks it up. You write the interrupt handler. You can't go in. If you're going to need R4, you got to be responsible for that, okay? Which means you got to put old R4 up on the stack, do whatever you're going to do, pull it back down before you exit your interrupt handler. Hardware's not going to do it for you. So it has, you would have, when you write the handler, it's the, it's the call is in. Yeah. 
Okay. You have to be ABI compliant. Okay. And then, um, does it only ever save these eight registers? For example, so the hardware only ever saves eight these eight registers. So I don't know. This might be a dumb question. What's the difference between like a link register and like like tracking um, the stack pointer or PC? Well, they have different functions. So I'm not quite sure what you mean, but the program counter, right? You need to know where you were beforehand, uh, and because it's not a normal function call. We're not going to use the link register to kind of do that. That's what we do in the past. We're, instead, we're just going to take the link register and the program counter, save it. We're going to use hardware to do it. We're going to do a task. We're going to come back. And then it doesn't matter where this came from, right? It only matters this program may, have been, may be nested itself in some function call. So that it needs that link register. So the easiest thing to do is just save all this stuff. Call your uh, IRQ, or sorry, your interrupt handler. You write your interrupt handler. You do anything you want. Uh, just uh, don't mess with those registers that aren't listed there. I feel you're looking at me like I'm still crazy. No, no. I, I, the only thing I'm sorry, I think was like, what, uh, I know R0 through 3. What's R12 again? Sorry, I'm just remember. R12 is the interprocedural scratch register, which is used mostly if you're running in an OS. Not really required, not something we're using for this uh, class, but it's just what is, is uh, kept. If you find some interesting use for it, go for it. All right, let's go through an example. Um, I guess there's a little bit of housekeeping beforehand. So this, oh, sorry, this goes in hardware. Great, there's a little bit of housekeeping. We talked about, uh, maybe you've seen this before, there's this stack pointer, there's two shadow registers, uh, the main stack pointer and a process stack pointer. Um, they have specific modes of operation um, based on the control state. The process stack pointer is primarily used when there's an OS. In this class, because we're writing basically bare metal code, we're just going to use the main stack pointer. So the main stack pointer always equals the stack pointer for this class. It's just giving you a heads up that it exists. Um, a little more details. Uh, basically, we're going to use stack pointer is going to equal the main stack pointer for uh, everything in this class. Let's see. Yeah. And then you can see that sometimes in your IDE, you'll see here that, you know, indeed that there's these extra shadow registers. And it really is this that the main stack pointer is equal to the uh, stack pointer. But it's, there's a trick that will occur in a little bit that we need to keep track of. OK. Uh, there's also the extra trick is that we're not going to the when uh, you're, as we'll see in an example, when you're in your interrupt, you will see that the link register is actually set to a unique value. And that tells hardware what to do. When you exit that service routine, it tells hardware you're supposed to unstack now, right? It's not telling hardware you're supposed to go back to this location. It's that you're supposed to unstack. So this is the value that you'll get on your devices. So it'll be FFFFF9. Uh, this is the value that will go in your link register. I think actually some of your dev kits may have the floating point version, so you might have an E in there. But that is the special Ooh, excuse me. Indicator that um, you're in an interrupt, and that how the interrupt when you leave it, how it should when you branch link register, what should happen? Well, it doesn't go to that memory location. Instead, it just uh, unstacks. All right. So let's go through any questions so far. All right. Let's go through an example. All right. So we have code here. Um, you have your main, then you have your uh, system timer handler. So this is code that you have written. We've written main as well. You have, you, right now you're in main, so here's the, the state of your registers. Uh, and you're pointing at the stack. The stack is, there's some data in stack. That's what access means. It's just not relevant. It's not the data that we're looking at in this uh, problem. OK, so we're going through. It happens to be at this location, an interrupt occurred. You are running this instruction. Okay? You have to complete the instruction that you're on 
in order to run the interrupt. So even though it's technically possible to between be doing an interrupt or be doing an instruction when the interrupt occurs, you wait till that instruction is complete. So it's not like halfway through a fetch or something. It is exactly then uh, that it occurs, or sorry, exactly afterwards that it occurs. Okay, so now um, we're gonna go look up. Um, we're going to assume that we're in main stack pointer mode, and then we're gonna do stacking. So stacking has occurred, right? We've just gone and taken the value of R0 through R3. R4 is just a toy extra one for this example. Of course, all the registers are there. We're just highlighting R4 here. R12, stack pointer, uh, link register, program counter, those are put up there. Stack pointer is not, I mean, but those other ones are placed up there. The stack pointer is incremented because now we were up there and now we're at uh, 1E0. Now we're going to go into our program. Our program's gonna do something. Who knows what it does? It's going to, we've incremented the link register to the special value. So FFFFF, nine. Uh, then we're gonna start, the program counter is pointed at this location. And we have the address here <coughs> has been defined as 1C, and that's what the program uh, counter is pointed at. We're going to do some ads. We're going to silly, we're going to manipulate R4, even though we shouldn't, because we're bad programmers. And then we're going to link to the link register. Again, the link register, or we're going to branch to the link register. So this is branch register, link register. And now it's the special link register, so that tells us values. That tells us we should unstack. And then we're going to replace all these values are going to go back into their respective registers, except for R4 here, which in this example is just to highlight that you, as the programmer of the interrupt handler, are still responsible to be ABI compliant, and that 5 wasn't there when we started. Yeah. So I guess my question is, originally the whole point of us doing interrupts was one of the examples you gave was like, we don't want a busy wait and yeah. wait for the button to be pressed. Correct. So like, in the previous in the previous example that we did at the beginning, how would we write a handler that like? Because let's assume I wanted to do that that read and then that yep. write to a certain register. But you're telling us, you know. Okay, so you'd go through. You write everything. You, you'd you'd well sure, but you you're not going to go in here and pull. Right? You're not, you're not writing here and say, okay, go check this register, and then if there's something there, go update the, the LED. You know the, so, you, so you've gone through and previously you've configured your GPIO to when this pin is rising, call this function, okay? And so now you don't have to constantly check, and then you could just have a line that says, write to this button, or write to this LED, and so it's just one line. And so you're generally able to do lots of code execution in main, so you get high CPU utilization, and it only takes you the latency to get into the interrupt, write the LED high, and then get out. So you basically got responsiveness and CPU utilization out of this. Can you call an interrupt when you're inside of an interrupt? Snack yeah. We'll talk about that later. How does the interrupt work in relation to like finishing the current instruction if you have a pipeline to the processor? It just stops it. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, so actually that's a great point. It's not something we go into detail about how, because we've got three-stage pipeline, all that sort of stuff. So what happens with those other things? I think it just stops, although I can imagine cases where basically you're going to, you'd flush your pipeline and then you have to restart. So. My guess is that's probably what happens, and you just enter, have more latency. So depending on the interrupt, you're somewhere between 6 to 12 cycles of latency to get in and out, or to get into it. What other, what other questions do you have? So when we go back into main after this, right? And then, but I'm confused, it's like, Interrupts happen, for example, like division by zero, right? You said we finish the instruction before we go to the interrupt. Mm -hmm. How would you finish that instruction? And then not only that, once you finish, once you do the interrupt, why would you want to go back to main? Wouldn't that like cost kind of like? Let's look at an example where it wasn't uh, program execution that caused it, and we'll come back to program execution. So the more typical thing is some peripheral needs attention, 
So you set a timer off that says, in you know, 10,000 cycles, wake me up so I can do a task. Then it just interrupts. The interrupt goes high. It stops, it stops whatever, it, whenever it occurs, it completes the instructions on and goes to the next code. Then you're in here, and then you do whatever task you're supposed to do. So if it was a really long, complicated task, my suggestion would be is you just set a flag maybe in main, and next time you come back to that flag, you're like, okay, now I need to do that task. But if it's a short task, then you can do everything in the interrupt. I would not, it's not generally uh, expect that you spend all your time in your interrupt. That would be a little bit weird. Um, do you the address of the interrupt is in our state, right? Is what? So it's in the register for state. The address of the interrupt is in, um, yeah. So when the interrupt occurred, when, when stacking occurred, it, the NVIC said, okay, here's where I need to go next. It went to the uh, interrupt or the vector table and said, this interrupt occurred, looked up and said, this is the uh, program counter that's required and it changed the program counter to this location. No, that's what I want to confirm is that like the NVIC is what handled all of that like that's the, the, the vector table is not shown here. Like correct. The, the NVIC is what went back, grabbed this address, and then shoved it in PC. Yep. Yeah. So essentially, hardware does it for you. You don't have to do it. You just have to know that it's happening. Other questions? Okay, that's it. Wow, you guys blasted through class today. I'll find more slides. Hold on. <laughs> All right. Well, we just we can just do review for the exam, or we can talk about whatever you want to do. We'll just have office hours instead. Yeah. Uh, for lecture on Wednesday, is it going to be like a general review, or will we be going over the practice exams posted? I was going to do a general review and let you guys ask questions. Um, yeah. Yep. Um. The problem for the current homework. <laughs> what about it? Any, any like guidance? Or oh yeah, sure. You want to talk about that? Yeah, let's talk about that. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's fine. This is the largest office hours I've ever had. <laughs> uh, let, yeah, let me pull it up. You guys can ask questions. What? What? Do you have a question already? You want? I don't have any particular questions, but it's just like I'm kind of like, how do I even go about that? Oh, good. This is fine. We can just. That's great. Let's do that. Three. This one. What's your question? Yeah. My question about it is, is it necessary for the peripheral to have read and write capability or the fact is the fact that it's just a sensor that triggers some function mean that we're not really meant to like wire the read and write force because what would that even do? Uh, you have not been instructed in this exam that it has to have read and write functionality. You just have to accomplish the task that was asked of you. So is there a convention for handling those parts of the bus when that's the case or is it just like set them to whatever you want? Set it to whatever you want that doesn't damage the bus. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I have a question about the meta stability and putting D flip flops there to like even out the signal. Yeah. So when we went over in lecture, we put two. Yeah. So is that you need those two in order to stay like? You need so. How do we know how do we know which, well, technically, which two flip flops count as <laughs> those two? That well, that's true. That's a good point. Because you got you have registers. Eventually, there's a lot of D flip flops in that chain. So eventually, you're going to find two. Okay, that's a that's a good counterpoint I had thought about. Um, so when you use meta, when you use two D flip flops, is when you have two asynchronous things. So if you're just in a clock system, it doesn't matter uh, because you know you're going to be away from the the transition edge. Um, I, in that case, I would write whatever lot, like whatever justification you want. I assume that there will be more later on. But I would generally say, if we're looking at metastability, that you want to put two D flip flops because you're trying to synchronize two, two clocks or two time domains. Yeah. And this doesn't remove the probability of like metastability. Like it doesn't make it zero, it just lowers it. Yeah. 
And then, but if you do three, I think it's the event is the time of the universe or something like that. I don't know. So two would be fine. Three if you're a medical company. All right, so why don't you talk amongst yourselves about how you think this problem works. And then uh, I'll, come, I'll come walk around and... And you guys can leave, look. If you want to, you're welcome to leave. We're just gonna do homework time. You may, you may have a question on a high level of what you learned here, but not like detailed. I'm so confused as if this one counts as a deep flip-flop in that stability or not. Mm -hmm. This is the second time you've gotten my name wrong. I can call you Forrest. <laughs> Are you Forrest? I knew you were somewhere back here. Uh, Where? What's your name then? Lucas. Okay. So, a couple of questions related to this one. Um, particularly this one. I was curious about the first question I had was is talking about when the clock is high, when the when the peak clock is high, like when when this is high, yeah. then it will set it to the value of time or data in. Do we have to handle that functionality, or are we assuming that okay? When it goes high, like, then it writes it to itself. Because I assume that we need to handle the functionality because we have the clock that's enabled with the clock. Is that a correct assumption? So, yeah, like that. So, let me restate this a little bit. So you're saying you have to you have to control when that thing goes high. I'm, I mean, like I'm more saying like it says that when the timer raises high, KDI is high when the timer clock goes high. Correct. And so is it latching it when it goes high, or do I need to? No, it will latch when the timer is enabled. So you have to enable it. Uh, is set high. High and the timer, time data, TDI is latched. Lashed. Yeah, so when this is high and that clock has hit, then it's latched in. Okay, so I don't need to only write to, but only the last. Yep. Okay. Uh, who's your lab instructor? Right, because you, uh, you, you send an email to uh, all the lab instructors in CCME, and we'll make sure somebody's got to reset you in grade scope. I feel like we don't. Yep. Because I feel like we're not using it, and we're not using like we're not using it to reference any. I think as long as you work it and you go like. I can't I'm Who's your eyes? I was gonna do it out like this. So maybe I'll just do like a little like oh, seven there, and I'll be. Oh, we'll look on the lab calendar. Yeah. Figure out who your. Yeah. 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 
I mean, this is awesome. Yeah. It technically could. However, the front office is like, this is one for right. Or one for right. One for right. One for right. I just, I just, I just, I just, some people have a way to do it. Why do you use syntax? It's just a lie. It's just 608. That's the thing, is like I was going through the slides and it's always, it's always out. So you need the best ability for like, they don't want to hire them. So I can say that I did all the impressive questions. That's it. So I guess maybe my design is very different. I am probably going to have that. Yeah. Okay. So once it goes high, it one slide, and then it's an entire project. And then you're like, it's okay. so it looks really like <laughs> <laughs> which I should be able to do like that tonight. But my other problem right now. Yeah, it's that it's not like the best that yeah. 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 So how to do it. Yeah. 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 Like, like, the scroll to the left. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Here, <laughs> 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 So I just took like the last two x values and assumed that yeah, you were going to be okay. Yeah. So I like, I'm doing these things. I just did it. So it was yeah. I just did it. I just wrote like math. Yeah. That's what I did. So, yeah. So, yeah. Drawing yeah. yeah. so, yeah. yeah. this the promise. Uh, like, it has the Did you use the, the, the clock? Yeah. 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 I like the exact same thing, but I just use the clock and like synchronize it with two different degrees. Oh, maybe this is it. I remember I used to ask. Oh, so it was, it was, um, if you have a reset, um, and so if you have a reset, that's what you're going to I was thinking, because the function of the reset was like, you have an S or a, I thought they update on So I guess it depends on if the reset signal is synchronous or asynchronous. If it's asynchronous, then that works, but if it's synchronous, then you have to use like, because then it would just update on the next time it comes around, but that wouldn't be, yeah. I'll reset the clock. Yeah, I'm going to ask for part one. Yeah, yeah, part one. Yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, it's called when you're going to write more robust control. So you're calling it like 20 straight times if it's five on 20 straight cycles. You're calling it once, and then input is high for 20 cycles. And then, so I don't know. Um, so you can end it also. Q value high until it's reset. So it looks like yours will go. Yeah, it's the time. Just write that down when you go in the other direction. Yeah. So I think it stays high until it's reset. Explicitly, that you need to do something with the ready signal that they would tell you, but I think in this, assume the timer is always ready. Yeah. They're not going to allow you to be so sloppy. They're going to say, right, right. You'll have to use some extra logic. So do that. Um, you have to drive all signals, even if they're unused. So I think you should just put something to here. Yeah. So, I don't know. Otherwise, that. So then in the last problem, you would just like drive this to row. I So like I, I had like two down That's exactly like I just had to start right in the same. Yeah. Uh, right. So I don't think I'm not sure if you can make any of these. I guess that might work, yeah. Yes.
I don't know. I, I just it would be redundant, I guess. Yeah, in that case. Yeah, because I see what you mean, because if he sell it, it'll be high. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, that, that makes sense. I don't know which way I would go, but, yeah. Uh, uh, set manually, so I did like a difference calculator. Sure so, like, you have the magnet spinning, and as long as the magnet's in X range, you look like what I was in can be this range. But when you call the C flow go up and the enable Like, you I didn't have reset. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's okay. That was going to be bridge one, two, three. So I just did like a right. How do you know how long it's taking? Oh. zero, then you interact with that. No, I was in a scheme once because technically you could. Bro, the lining, the, they're all little lined up. <laughs> I still don't know when input drops to zero. You don't need to know. So I think that's what I was trying to do. Here you have to push it because you don't know it. Maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, and just write underneath what the what address you're asking for. Spend like I mean, it's easier than writing the bubble logic. Yeah. Why are you X one? Thirty minutes of work is pretty obvious. I'm like, how am I going to go about this? And the timer thing, I just made so much complicated. That's great. See now that I can go back. Because I had like register and like register information. Uh, when this thing is talking, in examples in lecture, it's always like save. It's like push. It seems like it should work. So, so like you like did you like do a timer like interrupt? No, I just said like really we can just have the. That's what I said. I mean, I think I'm just going to go to this address. She's not great. About this problem. The core is going to be writing or doing your my funk. Very quickly compared to this slow wind vane, it's going to be moving around very slowly. Okay, so that should help with some timing of how long things need to take. You're not. It's unlikely that you're going to uh, be in my function and have the wind vane go high again. That would be surprising in a hurricane. <laughs> Like uh, uh, no, it, you can, it still has power. Later on, you'll see that some peripherals you actually have a table, like you have a timer. You enable, even though the bus isn't talking to the timer, the timer still works. Oh, it's hot. 
Yeah. How about we invent a bus system in which you can talk to the core, can talk to peripherals? This is just going to trigger whenever I use the trigger as the So when this rises, it'll just send it. This is synchronized. controlling this one, and then anything about yeah. the output will be. Okay. So how is this going to go? So it's going to use the whole. So, so, so reset works. I think this is. I 